Welcome to another edition of DXB Today. Hope you've had a very productive day. Uh, how's the side hustle going? You're ready to make the jump, make the leap, and make the startup your future that you've been dreaming of? Well, forget the tank, the shark one that is. Forget the den, the dragons one that is. Uh, today, it's all about DXB Today's Investor Forum as we look at the landscape of startups here in Dubai. This is what's coming up on the show. Amy heads down for a one-of-a-kind culinary experience at Arizona, bringing together the flavors of Turkey and the Middle East. And we've got the multi-talented artist Lena Amor joining us in the studio for some wonderful music. Now, we are talking startups. We're talking, as you mentioned, side hustles. Um, I've got one, Tom. I've got a few. I know Ash has. Where's yours, mate? What's going on? When are you starting your side hustle? I am really interested to know. And we've got I, the people I don't think, here. I don't think Tom has a side hustle because his main hustle <laughs> is, is the hustle of it all. Like, I don't know anyone who hustles harder than Tom. I know, does. I know. But we're OGs <laughs> in the game, man. What about you, Tom? I mean, you've been hustling here in the Middle East for so many years, and I can't think of a better person to speak on the subject than you. Um, look, it, and I think that's possibly where we're going to go with this one because we want to talk about you know I come from the UK and albeit yeah you mentioned that I've been here for quite some time uh, 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 but one thing that has been a common throughout is that sort of pioneering spirit and that ability to turn your hustle into a livelihood um, I think and I'm going to make the argument tonight that there is that infrastructure, that is spirit of startup here. You can build, you can fund, you can scale, and you can do it, I don't want to use the word easy, but you can do it more efficiently here than you can in other parts of the world. I think the city is a place that helps to breed that startup culture. Um, that's just my theory. That's why we've got three guests in to either back it up or say, Tom, you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, there are too many attractive things about Dubai, right? From the strategic location to the robust infrastructure, the booming business environment. I mean, if you were to just look at the tax benefits alone, I mean, so far there are no corporate federal taxes here in the country. Uh, the free zones, some of them offer almost 100% um, foreign ownership and, of course, full repatriation on profits, no import export duties. So there are so many things about this city that makes it so attractive for people to start businesses, particularly startups. Indeed. So this is why we say, Tom, do it now. Get in there now before the tax is raised and uh, have your side hustle flourishing as it should. But we've got to talk about this with some of our guest experts here today and our guest co-host. Let's find out who that is. My name is Mahmoud Bartawi. I'm an entrepreneur and investor, and I can't wait to see you shortly. Mahmoud will join us right here in just a little bit, but first, fusing traditional flavors with an innovative approach, Amy headed down to Arizona, a sprawling modern Turkish restaurant to try out their specially curated menu by Chef Mehmet Gors. So let's have a look. Hi, my name is Mehmet Gors. We have eight kitchen at Arizona. The passion starts with the taste, with the flavor of the ingredients. I'm here in Arizona, a culinary destination that is more than just a restaurant. It's a celebration of Middle Eastern culture and cuisine. When you look at Arizona, it's an idea that we have had for quite a few years bringing a lot of the food cultures and, and cooking and ingredients of the general Middle Eastern regions. You sit here, or you can get food from everywhere, or you can sit at the counter, have a quick bite there. So there's a lot of, it, it, it almost reflects the, the, the vibrancy of the region. Two, we have a coffee roastery. We have a, a dedicated baklava kitchen where we start from scratch with do the dough and also when we want to do our uh, kadaif and then do the kunefe from that. So there's so many things we can play around with and so we started thinking of menus of, okay, what do we want to eat? What do we like to eat? Thank you, chef. Yeah, yeah. 
Mm. What's good in Syria? What's good in Iran? What's good in the, around the Emirates or around the, the Arabian Peninsula? What's good in Lebanon, etc., etc.? Like, what's good in Turkey? And we like this, we want to do that, we want to do this, we want to do that, and we did a wish list. And then we started focusing into to, uh, more and more the menu we, we have today. But, but for us, when we look at food, that's where we would start. Wonderful artists making these beautiful things, or, or uh, beautiful glassware mm -hmm. uh, as well. Th those are coming from Turkey, handmade glassware, all artisans, artists, or the copper here. So So Miss Kay, um, enjoying herself down there in what looks like another stunning, stunning venue uh, and another dream becoming a reality. That's one of the themes of the show today uh, as we look at the startup scene right here in Dubai. Uh, joining us as guest co-host today is a seasoned entrepreneur who sold his successful healthy food business under 500 to uh, Kitopi. He's now helping companies unlock uh, opportunities for growth and expansion, not just here in the UAE, but across the whole of the GCC market. Please welcome to the show, to DXB today, uh, Mahmoud Batawi. Mahmoud, good to see you as always. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Listen, we want to talk about uh, all those uh, businesses that you've been involved with under 500, but let's start with an overall if we'll go. Let's go, let's go macro rather than micro. I mean, you've been there done that in the startup scene you now consult those looking to make a name for yourself right what's the biggest it's it, it's a vibrant scene there's a lot of people coming here looking to get into the startup scene everyone's got the hustle as well going on what's the biggest mistake you see out there that people make when it comes to startups um biggest mistake well there are a few um i would say um thinking that funding is the issue yeah I would say that's the number one reason people, uh, I mean, that's the number one mistake is, you know, people go back, they take a step back and say, I don't have the funding. Mm. Um, but there are many ways to solve that problem. I mean, you could get a co-founder to do that job and potentially with a co-founder, lower that amount that you want and then get an investor. And then that way you prove that you have an idea that is, uh, that can get people interested. Uh, number two, you prove that you get someone to work with you, which means you're a likable person and you can be part of a team. Yeah. Um, and the third thing, you cut down all of your costs and then you have co-founding. And I think traditionally uh, the investor or I would say the entrepreneur always thinks, you know, it's a one man show. Deep down in, everyone has an idea that they want to be the person on top, but it takes a team to get there. And I think the number one uh, problem that startups make is they think that, you know, I don't have money, I'm not going to do it. Mm. They don't figure out that it's a team game mm. on every level. If, if you're in a kitchen, if you're raising money, if you're in a, starting a company, you, you need to put the parts together. <laughs> I think that's where the frustration starts, putting these parts together. So my question to you is what method do you use to validate certain business ideas before it before you actually apply them and it comes to fruition. How important is that early stage of market research before jumping into something? Yeah, so you have to kind of have a financial, uh, you know, overview is you have to think about, uh, you know, I can, I can give you different ways. Uh, one way could be to say, I work a full-time job, I make 20,000 dirhams a month, and I want a startup, you know, I eventually want to uh, have a, a startup that will at some point pay me my salary. Mm -hmm. If you work that backwards and you think 20,000 a month, you take that into 12 months, that's 240,000. 
240,000. What is a business that would give you 2.4 million in top line and gave you 10% as a profit or a salary? It's just a way of thinking about it. So then you think about, okay, I'm looking for a business to start that will give me 2.5 million in revenue to cover my, that's one way of thinking about it when you're in a job, because most people thinking about doing a business are actually in a job, used to a fixed salary. So what is that job that you could do in another startup that could at least cover your salary? And that's the way I would explain it to someone that has a full-time job. Mm. Um, so in terms of food, yeah. obviously I've got a little food thing and, and, and food was and under 500 was a massive success. When you went into that, did you go into that thinking, I'm going to go global and go into international markets? Or was you just satisfied in the local market? Um, it's pretty interesting. That it's a pretty interesting question. I, uh, I wanted, so I, I did a master's in international business. Uh, my dream was always to have a global company that was more than just Dubai. Uh, when I got into under 500, I went, at that time, franchising was popular. So we took $60,000, which was a lot of money at the time, and it still is, just to work with Frank Corp, which was, you know, the uh, pretty staple uh, name in the franchising industry. And we basically got a crash course in nine months on how to franchise your business. So even though the business was not even a year old, we were able to franchise to the first person because we had a contract with a really good uh, franchiser. Uh, number two, we had a really good uh, return on investment on the healthy food. People love healthy food at the time. Uh, so when we started, just to go a step back, when we entered the healthy food game, there were meal plans. Have, have, have any of you guys? Of yeah. course. Yeah, I'm yeah, currently yeah. on one. <laughs> right, you carry it two months, yeah. you open it. It's, it's a commitment. It's a two month commitment minimum if you want to get on a meal plan and see results. We thought about, what is the top of the funnel? Like, what if someone wants to feel that they're healthy? Because you sell to emotions, right? So we call the brand under 500. So if you have three meals a day, you'd have 1,500. And the average BMR is 1,800, which is the average calories a human needs to stay. So if the average is 1,800 and we, we did three meals, 500 each, then a person who wanted to go healthy could order one meal at under 500 calories and get the feeling that they were healthy. So that's the top of the funnel. Before they'd think about going into a full commitment of a meal plan, and we got really cool influencers. So there was a time where we had 200 influencers between Dubai, Kuwait, and Saudi just wearing our brand, in, you know, posting, getting food, showing people that it's cool to be healthy. The idea was how do you change perception from hospital food or, you know, how do you make it something cool? It was cool in other parts of the world, but in this part where you have very high obesity, we wanted to, to tackle that. It was a marketing thing, I think, and, and counting calories. You've just lit up talking about under 500. You have just come to life. You have just shown how personal that brand was to you. But you sold that brand. Right. You sold to Katopi. Yeah. So the businessman in you took over as well. And it goes back to the point Ash was mentioning there. Okay, getting funding in to get this thing off the ground. Yeah. What about that even more difficult decision about getting out and selling? Yeah, that's uh, you know that's something I think every founder deals with after they sell something is what do I do next? So I completely agree with you. I think uh, it leaves a void, yeah. and you try to fill that up with new startups and with new uh, you know you, you you kind of take more an advisory role, an investing role. I would say that's kind of. Uh, but to answer your question, nothing beats the excitement of being in a startup. So I'm all for startups. <laughs> if you have a startup out there, like just, you know, if it gives you that, then, 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 then uh, you know, keep going. Mamou, thank you. Stick around, please. We're trying to convince Tom uh, to start up something very soon. And now coming up, we find out how to attract investors to scale up your startup to the next level with the team of Aditum Investment Management. So stick with us.